Hello friends, you are watching 3ABN Sabbath School panel and as always we want to thank you for joining us week after week after week as we make our way through a study of God's Word and of course this quarter we are taking on the book of Psalms and uh, yes there's no way we're going to be able to read every single verse and every passage but we're going to hit all the high points and we're going to have a deep detailed study each and every week so we're excited that you're joining us. Let me introduce our panel. We have Miss Shelley Quinn to my direct left. Great to be here. I have Monday's lesson, Trust in Times of Trouble. All right. To your left is Brother, Doctor, Surgeon, Daniel Perrin. All right. I don't know about a surgeon, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm excited to see what we can pull out of these psalms. I have right. Tuesday's lesson, A Psalm of Despair. Ah, yes. And then, of course, to your left is Miss Jill Marconi. Thank you, Ryan. Excited to be here on Wednesday. We look at From Despair to Hope. Mm. All right. And last but not least, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here. I would call Daniel a biblical surgeon. That's right. I have Thursday's lesson, Oh, Restore Us Again. Amen, amen. I'm excited about this week because as we're going to learn, the book of Psalms is a big, giant book of prayer. We can use it as prayers. We can learn how to pray, and we're going to be focusing on that this week. Before we actually pray and get into our lesson, I do want to remind you of something new that we are doing. Uh, some of you may be watching for the first time and be hearing this for the first time, but uh, we are making our notes available to you. For those who want a copy of the panelist notes from week to week, um, each week we will be providing those and making those avail available via email. And so that email address, get your pen ready, write it down, ssp at 3abn.org. Again, that's ssp at 3abn.org. You can simply send us an email, request the notes, and we'll be sure to get those to you. Uh, and you can study along with us, and you can use the notes uh, to prepare for your own Sabbath school study at church. Uh, but before we dive into our weekly study, let's go ahead. I'm going to ask Shelly if you would pray for us. I'd love to. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we call upon you as the God of our righteousness. We thank you, Lord, that you have shown us your path of life and we find fullness of joy in your presence. As we speak, Lord, empty us of us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and may we and everyone who hears our voice be blessed by your Spirit as our teacher. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Christ we pray, amen. 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 Praise God. I'm, again, I'm your host, Ryan Day, and I'm going to actually start with uh, Sabbath afternoon's lesson. I always love reading Sabbath afternoon's lesson because it helps just kind of as a kickstarter to get us going for what we're going to be studying that week. And the lesson brings out that a, a, brief, uh, a belief that only spontaneous, unlearned prayer is a real prayer appears to be prevalent among Christians. However, Jesus' disciples were immensely rewarded when they asked Jesus to teach them to pray. God placed a prayer book, the Psalms, at the heart of the Bible, not simply to show us how God's people of ancient times prayed, but also to teach us how, to, how we can pray even today. Uh, from the earliest ages, the Psalms have shaped the prayers of God's people, including Jesus' prayers. We see this in 1 Chronicles 16, 7 and 9, Nehemiah 12, 8, Matthew 27, 46, Ephesians 5, 19, and so many others. And it goes on to say this week, we will look at the role of the Psalms played in helping God's people traverse their life journey and grow in their relationship with God. We should remember that the Psalms are prayers and as such are invaluable, not only for their theological insight, but also for the ways they can enrich and transform our individual and communal prayers. Praying the Psalms has helped many believers establish and maintain regular and fulfilling prayer lives. And I can absolutely attest to this because I've found myself on a many occasion praying one of the Psalms mm -hmm. uh, because I couldn't find, as the scripture says, sometimes we can't find those words. We know not mm -hmm. how we ought to pray. And you know how the Bible says in Romans chapter eight that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for mm -hmm. us. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will place a Psalm upon your heart and say, mm -hmm. pray that. That's what you need at this time. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to learn about that this week. I'm going to jump into Sunday's lesson entitled Fostering the Use of the Psalms in Prayer. And of course, the lesson asks us, what is the place of the Psalms in a believer's worship experience? And uh, we're going to jump right 
right into Psalm 105 and verse 5. You really see prayer, uh, uh, praise and acknowledgement. As you're praying these Psalms, uh, it is important to acknowledge God in praise. That's why when I pray, I have learned as we see example in the Psalms and also in other parts of Scripture as well, we find incredible examples of God, uh, God's people, His, His, His authors, His prophets, His servants. Uh, they always usually many times begin with acknowledging God in praise mm -hmm. and uplifting His name and acknowledging Him. So uh, Psalm chapter 105 and verse 5, it says, Remember His marvelous works, which He has done, His wonders and the judgments of His mouth. It helps us to remember that God is creator. Yeah. He has established all things. We're not here unless it is for Him. And so there are times even in my own personal prayer, I like to just stop and pause and say, God, thank You for creating me. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. You for being the creator God that You are for. There is nothing without You. And that's just a wonderful way of just, you know, just kickstarting the prayer and acknowledging God's creative power. And of course, the psalm helps remind us of who we are dealing with and who we are serving because we're all on a journey of discovery, right? And learning who God is. And, and the psalms actually often help us to discover who it is that we're actually in relationship with and we're dealing with in these, uh, in these days. So Psalm chapter 145, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9. 145 verses 1 through 9. And I love these words uh, as, as he says here, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and great to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. I love that. His greatness is unsearchable. Amen. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Verse 5, I will med uh, meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are all over his works. My goodness, it's mm. almost poetic. It's just, it's powerful. When you, when you meditate on God's greatness, you often find, will find yourself as you grow in the Lord and as you find yourself in prayer, you'll pray those prayers. Lord, Amen. you are so good. I mean, I can't speak as great and poetically as the, the psalmist here. Uh, that's just not my gift. I don't have necessarily a gift of words, but in my own way, I praise God often in my prayers. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your creative power. Thank you for intervening in my life. Thank you for the glory of your majesty and all that you have bestowed upon mankind. Those praises, those worships, uh, uh, acknowledging his goodness and his majesty, uh, that it should be and often incorporated in our prayers. The lesson study also uh, leads us to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 to highlight the fact that the Psalms, in praying the Psalms, actually help incorporate those words, those powerful, life-changing words to take root in us and to be within us. Notice Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I love that. It does us no good to just read the Bible mm -hmm. and, and not memorize it or not allow it to take root in our life. And so the Psalms are powerful in that way that if you read them, not just read them, but pray them as often as you pray them, as often as you mean them, as often as you come back and re, uh, reintroduce yourself to these powerful words, they are taking root in you and of course bringing about wisdom. It goes on to say teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And of course, I couple that with uh, Psalm 119, verse 11, because of course we know the, the text very well. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. When we pray the Psalms and we incorporate the Psalms even in our prayer, our daily prayer lives, again, we're allowing the word of God to take foundation in our hearts and minds so that we may never forget it. And of course, it is transformative in nature. The more you have the word of God in you, the more you meditate on it, the more you reflect on it, the more you pray it, of course, it will take root in your life and it will help you overcome a multitude of sin as the scripture brings out here. And then I love James chapter five, verse 13. I love this right here because it says, is anyone among you suffering? Mm. Let him pray 
But then oftentimes one of the best ways to pray is often to sing because it says, if anyone is cheerful, let him sing psalms. I have found myself singing a prayer. In fact, uh, I'll give you an example here. Psalm 51 is a prayer, right? <laughs> Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. I find myself singing that sometimes when I find uh, m maybe, maybe I'm having a tough day. Maybe I'm, maybe I've been through some stuff and I feel like, Lord, I need you to cleanse me. I need you to come into my heart. I will find myself singing a psalm. Of course, there's one that I learned recently, Psalm 64, which you don't often hear uh, people quote this psalm, but Psalm 64, verse one and two. And I love uh, the, the person who put music to this uh, because it says, um, Hear my voice, O oh God, in my prayer, preserve my life from fear of the enemy. And then he goes on to say, verse 2, hide me from the secret count to love the wicked from the workers of iniquity. I love that. If you sing the Psalms, you're praying the Psalms, they're taking deep root into your life. And that's what this lesson all this week is bringing out, the power of prayer, learning how, as the lesson brings out, fostering the use of Psalms in prayer is a powerful thing. Now, in my early journey, I didn't really understand this and I couldn't mm. quite understand why it's important for us to incorporate the Psalms in this way in our prayer life, in meditation, in singing, and of course in proclamation, but it certainly helps tremendously. Uh, the lesson brings out a few points here, and I just want to end with the time that I have here of just highlighting a few points that uh, in, in how we incorporate it in a prayerful way in our life. So read and pray Psalms that correspond to your present situation. Whatever it happens to be, there are Psalms of lament, Psalms of communal lament and thanksgiving, Psalms of hymns, or Psalms, hymns, potential Psalms, the Wisdom Psalms, Seeking God's Wisdom and Guidance, Historical Psalms, Psalms Containing Anger and Rage, and Pilgrimage Songs as well. So there's all types of different Psalms there that you can incorporate in your prayer life. Uh, read the Psalms engaging in simple reflection and then pray. Ruminating over the Psalms involves reflection on the various aspects of the Psalm, the way the Psalmist addresses God, and of course the reasons for the prayer itself. Uh, number three here, consider how your situation corresponds to the Psalmist experience and how the Psalm might be able to help you articulate your experience. Number four, if something in the psalm challenges you, ponder, for example, whether the psalm corrects your present false hopes about something you are facing. Number five, contemplate the psalm's message in the light of Christ's person and salvific work and the long-term hope Christ's work offers us. We should always look at everything in the Bible in the light of Christ and the cross. Amen. We see this theme all the way through the psalms, by the way. Uh, number six, look for new motives for prayer that the psalm supplies and think about their importance for you and for your church and, of course, for the world. And then lastly here, our point number seven, if the psalm corresponds to the situation of someone you know, intercede in prayer for that person. These are ways that we can foster the Psalms in our, prayer, in our prayers on a daily basis. Amen. Thank you for singing. Amen. I won't sing my song. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Shelly Quinn and I have Monday's lesson, Trust in Times of Trouble. The point of worship is to express your heart and your feelings openly to God and prayer. And you know, I find that many Christians think it is faithless if they utter a complaint mm. to the Lord mm. or if they utter a complaint mm. to someone else. Mm. I know people who will say, well, you ask what's going on. This is what's going on. And then they'll go, oh, but it's okay. It's okay. And I'll go, no, that's not mm. okay. Yeah. That's bad. The, the beautiful thing is that Sometimes there is innocent suffering in this world. That's right. And God understands when we pray to him about mm -hmm. it. These Psalms of Lament were written by divine inspiration and sometimes they're for the benefit of mm -hmm. us all. Mm -hmm. But they show what it's like mm -hmm. to feel confusion and despair. Right. Haven't you been there before? We're going to read Psalm 44 today because this is relevant to all ages. But I have to say this, what this psalm is going to show us 
is not to invalidate our own feelings by going, oh, it's okay. Sometimes it's not okay. And I'm going to get on a hobby horse for just a second. People will say, oh, God won't put on us more than we can bear. That is not what scripture says. Scripture says he will not tempt us beyond what we can handle. But listen to 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9 from Paul. Okay. And he says, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant of our trouble, which we came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, mm. Mm. beyond measure, above strength so that we even despaired of life. Mm. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves mm. that we should, here's the purpose statement, that mm. we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the That's dead. Right. That's so so mm -hmm. there's times that things are beyond measure, but God's doing it for a purpose. He's trying to as Hebrews 4, 16 says, he's inviting us to come boldly before his throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace in a time of need. Don't censure your experience. Don't sit here and deny it or you're going to remain in bondage to your emotions. Mm -hmm. What prayer is, prayer is where our heart meets with God's heart. So let's look at Psalm 44. It's a psalm of faith and a psalm of sorrow. Israel's experiencing a disturbing defeat on the battlefield. And this records the experiences that they're confused by their suffering. They're, they're in despair. Psalm 44 is divided into three parts. Note this. First, it focuses on what God has done in the past. Mm -hmm. Then the confusion on what he's doing or not doing <laughs> currently. And then it focuses on future redemption. So the psalmist begins with praise. He's going to acknowledge God's divine grace and intervention in Israel's past to give them victory over enemies. Psalm 44, verse 5. Then he says, through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your name, we will trample those who rise against us. This expresses trust mm -hmm. in God alone. So he started off with all of this praise, talking about what God has done in the past. He changes midstream. Now he's got a bitter complaint. <laughs> he's expressing his confusion. And he concludes, as we do so often, <laughs> in our humanity, if God's not doing everything in our t on our timetable, he concludes that God has abandoned Israel because they were so easily defeated. And this contrasted God's former victories. So he's confused and he says basically, hey, Israel is sincerely following you, Lord. We haven't reached out to idols. So here's the thing that we've got to remember. Even though there are times that we haven't forsaken God's covenant, when our spiritual walk is like Israel, they were actually walking in faithfulness. God still allows things to happen in our lives. And, and we're gonna look at that. Psalm 44, this is from the quarterly, can help worshipers articulate their experience of innocent suffering frequently and adequately. Mm. Praying the Psalms helps people experience freedom of speech in prayer. Yeah. Isn't that precious? Freedom of speech in prayer. The mm. Psalms give us words that we can ne neither find nor dare to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of the times I read this, I remember when I first started reading the Psalms mm. decades ago, and I think, Whoa, I can't believe he said that. Mm -hmm. Like, here's, here's what uh, Psalm 44, 18 says. Mm. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way, Lord, but you have severely broken us in the place of jackals, and you've covered us with the shadow of death. Mm. What? 
-hmm. How can somebody of faith say that? Listen to Psalm 44, 22. For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Israel wasn't suffering because they deserted God. Mm. They were suffering because they were following God. You ask anyone here mm. on this panel, you ask anyone who's in full-time ministry, man, I'll tell you what, the devil's got his assignments against us, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. And his wicked followers hate the righteous. He, he, the opposition can be strong. Mm -hmm. And so we, as God's people, endure affliction today, just as they did. But here's what I love about Psalm 44, 22. We're, I'm going to read to you from Romans 8, 35, 39 because Paul is quoting Psalm 44, 22. It's a direct mm -hmm. quote. He says though, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written? Here's his quote, mm -hmm. Psalm 44, 22. For your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But now listen to Paul. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans 8, 38, he says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels, principalities, powers, nor present things or things to come, not height, not depth, nor any other created thing. He's not going to leave anything out of this list shall be able to separate us from the love of God, mm -hmm. which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul's praying Psalm 44, 22, right here. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing, now we've gone from praising God for the past to the bitter complaint in the middle. Let's look at Psalm 44, 23, because now the psalmist is acknowledging the reality of God's love and he cries out in faith for the future deliverance from enemies. Psalm 44, verse 23. Awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, do not cast off forever. First of all, I have to tell you, they knew Psalm 121, verse 4 says, God never slumbers or sleeps. Mm -hmm. They weren't this was a poetic way of trying to get God's attention. They knew he wasn't asleep. He, they, he just was calling upon God to act. Verse 24, why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our body clings to the ground. You know, here's what, please hear me. There are times when you don't understand your circumstances, no. when you can't see God's mm -hmm. hand moving, when you can't see his hand, trust his heart. Mm -hmm. He's there. He's working. Mm -hmm. Then he says in verse 26, arise for our help. Redeem us for your mercy's sake. He's calling out in boldness on God to fight for Israel again. And so he comes full circle. He started with the history of God's faithfulness and intervention. He ends with the hope for his gracious redemption in the near future. And when he used that word mercy, that's his said, God's loving kindness, his covenant faithfulness, his grace. So hope for today is found in understanding the past that we can trust him in times of trouble. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. That's a powerful lesson, Shelley. Thank you. My friends, don't go anywhere. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back right in just a moment. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. 
Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it on to Daniel Perrin for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you very much. And I do have Tuesday's lesson. I'm Daniel Perrin, and it is a psalm of despair. Mm -hmm. So I start with the question, how honest can you really be mm. with God? Mm. Can you really tell him everything? Mm. Especially in those times where you're going through a dark and lonely time. And the answer is found in Psalm 22, which many people call the Psalm of the Cross. And we'll see why. First Chronicles 25, verse one, you don't need to turn there, but that text says that the musicians in the temple were to prophesy. And this musical psalm right here certainly is prophetic. Jesus actually quotes the first line of this psalm on the cross mm. in Matthew 27, verse 46. Now I, I imagine any one of us here, could never write this psalm. I could not come up with this stuff from myself. I can read it, but this certainly came from the inspired word of God. It could not come from me. Uh, we're used to poems in the Bible, Psalms in the Bible like this. I cried out to the Lord and he heard me. Mm -hmm. David says that. Moses, mm -hmm. Noah, Hannah, Hagar, Peter, save me. And Jesus saves him. But in the greatest agony of all time in all the universe, this song right here, prayed by Jesus to the Father, is different. And in this, Jesus directs us when we are going through despair to come back to this psalm and to understand his suffering and our suffering. Psalm 22, verse 1. Such familiar words. Mm -hmm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? If I were to put this translated into words that I can hold on to, uh, God, I'm holding on to you, but I don't see you. Mm. My faith is struggling with fear. I, I, I don't see any hope of deliverance and I don't feel like you're with me. Mm. That's pretty honest. This starts out in complete devastation. Looking at Jesus, he was not only abused by Satan and people and angels, while they're doing everything to discourage and destroy him, holding nothing back, but he is also being abandoned by angels, men, and by God. Mm. In some ways, this psalm gives us a fuller picture of the crucifixion. We actually see inside of what is going on in the heart of Jesus. This is one of those numerous places in the Old Testament where literally over a thousand years in advance, many years in advance, the life of Jesus is revealed to us, inspired through the Holy Spirit. David writes this down here. And uh, verse 11, join me in verse 11. We'll read all the way to verse 18 and just see the cross here. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of the earth of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Mm. Mm. This is a picture of the cross right here. When we're in the midst of a time of trouble in our life, time of despair, we are directed to look at the cross. Amen. And why is that? Because Jesus' suffering gives us a model about how we can walk through suffering because he has. In the lesson, it writes it like this. The Psalms supervise our experience according to God's standards. It's like when you're blindfolded and you need someone to lead you. Mm. I don't know how to go through this time of despair. Mm. Lord, you've been through it. Right. Lead me through it. Mm. And so the first 21 verses honestly expressing, here's exactly what I'm going through and how I feel about it. But what we notice is that the psalmist here, the sufferer, Jesus, he does not let loose 
in frustration and anger and bitterness and sarcasm. We are apparently not given freedom to just say anything. Our words do matter. In the book by Ellen White, That I May Know Him, page 137, these lines here, you are not conscious of how much you are affected by your words. You accustom yourself to speak in a certain way and your thoughts and actions follow your words. And so we say, Lord, when I'm going through dark times, supervise my words. Help me to do what Jesus did. And what did he do? Mm -hmm. Verse 7 of this psalm, we see this. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Mm -hmm. It was Jesus' pattern, and we see that on the cross. That's exactly what they said to him in Matthew 27, 43. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. So all the universe is gathered around, literally watching Jesus on the cross in his agony. What will he do? Will he trust in the Father when the chips are down, when it's difficult, when push comes to shove? Verse 21 gives us the answer, and here's the pattern, and may we be able to pray this prayer by God's grace. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. And here it is. You have yes. answered me. Amen. This is a declaration of faith made to all of us Amen. that we can make too. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. Mm -hmm. Jesus trusted God through the agony. But the question is, can we? Mm. Back in 1555, Thomas Hawkes, he was a Protestant in England at the time of Queen Mary when uh, he refused to have his infant son baptized, which gave opportunity for his enemies to then bring accusation against him and throw him into prison. And they offered him his life if he would recant his Protestant faith. And he said, if I had a hundred bodies, I would suffer them all to be torn in pieces mm -hmm. rather than I will abjure and recant. Several more mm -hmm. times he was offered life in place of giving up his Protestant faith. But he was sentenced to burning. Mm -hmm. And so they put him in prison, waiting his execution. And during that time in prison, they, off they allowed some of his friends to come in and visit him. And when his friends came in to visit him, they encouraged him, but they said, I don't know if I could make it, if I am called to go through the flames. Will you give us some sign that Jesus is enough, that his grace is sufficient? Mm. And so Thomas Hawkes, he agreed that, that he would raise his hands as he was dying if Jesus was enough, if he could make it through. And so the day came and he was gracious to his executioners as they attached him by chain to the pole and he pointed out to them the sin of shedding innocent blood and then he began praying to God as Jesus did on the mm. cross. And as the, the, the roar of the flames drowned out the voice of his prayers, everybody watched as his skin tightened and his fingers burned off and he was perfectly still with his head down, and all thought that he was dead until his hands shot up in the air mm. and he clapped his hands three times as if in joy. <laughs> and a, a, a shout of, of triumph from his friends came out as he literally with his hands on fire, clapping his hands above his head, and they said, he is sufficient. Jesus is enough. He can take us through this, mm -hmm. whatever it is. When it feels like God has abandoned me, Philippians 4, 13, mm. Paul says, I can do all things mm. through him who strengthens me. I don't take this text to mean that God can help get me to the state championship. <laughs> this is God can bring me through whatever trial yes. he allows to come my way. Listen to this statement from Our High Calling, page 323. Our Heavenly Father measures and weighs every trial before He permits it to come upon the believer. Mm. He considers the circumstances and the strength of the one who is to stand under the proving and the test of God. And He never permits the temptations to be greater than the capacity of resistance. Mm. Here we have Jesus who lives out on the cross. My grace is sufficient for you. 
And then his, his example for us is an illustration that when we are in despair, we too can trust in God. Mm -hmm. And it's not gonna be on our own strength, but the strength that he provides in the moment. Lord, I trust in you. Amen. Amen. Thank you wow. so much, Daniel. That was powerful. And Shelly and Ryan, what an incredible lesson. Mm -hmm. I'm Jill Morricone. On Wednesday, we look at from despair to hope. And we're going a couple Psalms back to Psalm 13. We're gonna take a look at Psalm 13. I wrote down something that Shelley said when she was talking about don't censure your emotions. Mm -hmm. If I'm being transparent with you, the Psalms have been very therapeutic for me in my own journey with Jesus. You see, for many years, I felt a Christian, what I perceived a good Christian to be, would always be happy. A good Christian always lives at peace with people. A good Christian never expresses mm. anger. A good Christian never is irritated. A good Christian is never sad or has a down day. And when I read the Psalms, I discovered it was okay to have emotion. Mm. It's what we do with it. It's how we work through that. So I think Psalm 13 is extremely powerful because it shows us what are we to do with those emotions. If you look at Psalm 13, I divided it into three sections. The first part is the pain. This is the lament. The middle section is the petition. This is asking God, help me with what I'm dealing with right now. Mm. The final part is praise. We break forth in praise to God. So let's look at that. We'll start with the pain. That's the first two verses, Psalm 13, verses one and two. How long, O oh Lord? We see this phrase crying out to God comes four times actually in the first two verses. Mm. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? David's being honest with God. Mm. God, I feel as if you've abandoned me. Mm -hmm. This is what I call the apparent silence of God. Mm. It doesn't mean God is silence, but it means we can't, for whatever reason, see him or feel him or reach out and touch him. God is not answering my prayers. Have you experienced the agony of waiting? Mm. God, I want you to restore my marriage. God, I want you to bring my kids back to you. God, somebody I love is dying right now. God, how long? Why aren't you bringing physical healing? Why am I not seeing salvation take place here? Why is my house being foreclosed upon? Why is there this financial struggle? Mm -hmm. How long? We struggle because it seems like God delays in answering our prayers. Or maybe we have a personal setback or some sort of trial that we're going through right at that moment. Even sometimes we struggle with the seeming evil and injustice in the world. And we know God doesn't cause it, Satan does, but why is God permitting this to happen? How long? Takeaway number one, be honest with God Amen. in prayer. Be transparent with how you're feeling. God can handle how you're feeling because he already knows how you feel. Let's read verse two. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? You see, he's feeling oppressed mm -hmm. and depressed. He feels that the enemy is winning. Maybe you're dealing with addiction. Maybe you're dealing with fear. Maybe you're walking through a spiritual journey or battle and your heart cries out with this fourfold lament. How long? It's expressing fear and pain mm -hmm. and loneliness. This continuous emotional pain, takeaway number two, emotions are not wrong. Mm. It's what we do with them. Christians struggle with emotion too. Mm -hmm. We deal with anxiety and fear and worry. We deal with depression and sadness. We deal with anger and irritation. It's not wrong the emotion, but it's what we do with it. Mm. 
That's right. Now we shift from the pain to the middle section, which is the petition. For that, we look at the next two verses. We're in Psalm 13, verses 3 and 4. Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Now, it's interesting, there is no and in the Hebrew. So instead of saying, consider and hear me, it's even stronger than that. Mm. It's like we were to say, look, hear me. Mm -hmm. David's crying out to God, God, please, would you hear me? And I love how he says, oh Lord, my God. Mm -hmm. Even though he feels abandoned by God, even though he feels distant from God, he still calls him my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. We see the shift here from the pain to the petition, from complaining to requesting from God. Takeaway number three, don't be afraid to ask God for help. Tell God your needs. Tell God what's in your heart. Don't think, he's not going to answer, I'm not going to ask. Be honest and ask. Now we shift. We had the pain, the petition, or the request. Now we shift to praise. Mm. We see that in the last two verses, verses 5 and 6. Let's read verse 5. But I have trusted in your mercy. This is the word has said. Loving kindness, your covenant faithfulness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Takeaway number four, choose to exercise faith even when you cannot see and you cannot understand. You see, faith is not dependent on how I feel. If it were, my faith would be very weak. Faith is dependent on the object mm -hmm. in which our faith is placed. And we choose to place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing He is God and He cannot change and He is omnipotent and all powerful and He is love. You might say, but Jill, I don't have any faith. Every man, every woman is given a measure of faith. Romans 12, 3 says that. How do we build that faith? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Mm -hmm. If you want to build your faith, spend time in the word of God and recall to mind what God has done in the past. Remember the times he has come through, as it were, for you in the past. And that strengthens your faith in the present moment of crisis. Then it ends with verse six. This is breaking out in praise. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Weeping may endure for a night. Psalm 30 verse five tells us that. But joy, it comes in the morning. Takeaway number five, praise makes the enemy flee. Praise is a choice. Praise can change my feelings. Praise can turn my attitude around. Praise can turn my sorrow into joy. And we might not feel like praising, but when we make the choice to praise, God shows up. Mm -hmm. God changes our emotions. Mm -hmm. I wanna share with you in closing an experience. This happened many years ago with one of my friends. Mm. She had fell into a deep depression and she ended up in the mental hospital. Mm. I remember going to visit her there and she was sitting on her bed cross-legged, tears streaming down her face. And I remember I thought, God, I don't even know how to help. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And I remember thinking, well, we could pray together. And we prayed and she just continued rocking and crying. And she was in such a deep depression. And I remember I thought we could sing, but I don't sing well. And you know, you try different things. You try to talk to her, nothing worked. And then the thought came to me, read the word of God. Mm. And I started in Psalms chapter 90. Mm. Mm. What does that say? Oh, no, 91, 91 sorry. Yeah. Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place mm -hmm. of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. And mm -hmm. as I read that Psalm, her crying stopped, mm -hmm. her rocking stopped, and she looked at me. Joy broke forth. Mm -hmm. well. Now, does that mean the Word of God can bring you out of depression? Yes, absolutely, I believe it means that. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that we don't need modern science and medicine? Absolutely, we need that too. So I'm not negating that. 
I'm just saying I have never seen the power in the Word of God as strongly as I did that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what dark experience you are walking in, choose to open up the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Choose to praise. Choose to immerse your mind in God's Word and watch as He changes your emotions. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you so much, Jill. What a powerful message that God has for us in the Psalms. Thursday's lesson, my name is James Rafferty, is, Oh, Restore Us Again, and really, it is seeing the heart of God that restores us. We've learned from Jill that the Psalms teach us that it's okay to have emotions. And Daniel taught us that the Psalms teach us that Jesus is able to bring us through the most difficult times. Shelley, the Psalms remind us that God gives us freedom of speech. And Ryan, the Psalms help us when we don't know how to pray. Mm. So in this lesson, we're going to be looking at Psalm 60, verses 1 through 5. And the lesson says that for, the, for what occasions do you think this psalm would be suitable, a suitable prayer? How can we benefit, benefit from the psalms of lament mm. even in joyous seasons of time? You know, the psalms of lament can really speak to our hearts when we're going through difficulties, but what about when we're not really going through difficulties? How can we benefit from these psalms when we're going through joyous times in our life? And I think mm -hmm. one of the ways we can benefit, and we'll talk about this, is seeing how these psalms of lament actually speak mm -hmm. of the experience of our God and of His heart toward us mm -hmm. and not just our heart toward Him. Psalm 61 through 5, O God, Thou hast cast us off, Thou hast scattered us, Thou hast been displeased. O turn Thyself to us again. Verse 2, Thou hast made the earth to tremble, Thou hast broken it. Heal the breaches thereof, for it shaketh. Thou hast showed Thy people hard things, Thou hast made us drink the wine of astonishment. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear Thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth. Selah. Verse 5, that thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy great hand, and hear me. Mm. The Psalms of Lament are generally understood to be prayers, the lesson quarterly goes on to say, of people living through trying times, whether physical or psychological or spiritual or all three. However, this does not mean that we should avoid these Psalms even in the good times. Sometimes there may be a total disjunction from the words of the Psalms and the worshipers' present experience. That is, Psalms of Lament can be beneficial to worshipers who are not in distress. Mm -hmm. First, they can make us more aware that suffering is a part of the general human experience mm -hmm. and that it happens to both the righteous and the wicked. The Psalms assure us that God is in control and provides strength, solutions in times of trouble. Even in this Psalm, even amid the trouble, Brackets, you have made the earth to tremble, Psalm 60, verse 2. The psalmist displays his ultimate hope in God's deliverance. Now, second, the lesson goes on to say, the lament psalms teach us compassion towards sufferers. When expressing our happiness and gratitude to God, especially in public, we must be mindful of the less fortunate. Sure, we might have things good go right around us right now, but who doesn't? And who doesn't know of people all around us who are suffering terribly? And we see this in the world, all over the world today. And how can we relate to that? Sometimes we just want to shut off the news and, and close our ears to the pain and suffering of others. God can't do that. God doesn't do that. And God's people won't either. So how do we manage? How do we cope? How do we navigate with the troubles of others? Praying through the Psalms can help us not to forget those who are going through hard times. The Psalms can invoke in us compassion and a desire to minister to the suffering as Jesus did. And third, and this is just an added insight and perhaps I think most important of all, the Lament Psalms remind us that the God of heaven, the creator of all, the redeemer of all, the all-knowing, infinite, almighty God knows and sees all of the pain of all of the people mm -hmm all of the time. In Psalm 56, verse 8, it says, Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? God knows all of our wanderings. He knows of all of our tears. He knows of all of our troubles. Now, just selah, just think about that. Think about that for a minute. The way that God relates to the human family. God sees and records David's sufferings for sure. But we shouldn't miss this point that God sees and records all human suffering. Yeah. 
Not only so, but this same God stepped into the human race, not for a mere 33 years, but for all eternity to become forever the Son of Man mm -hmm. so that He could be touched with the feelings of our laments. As noted in Psalm 22, which Daniel shared earlier, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you've ever felt that way, if you've ever experienced that, well, God Himself in the person of Jesus Christ stepped into that experience with us. Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season I am not silent. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. And of course, this is a well-known prophetic psalm, a prophetic psalm of Christ and what he would experience being pierced, that is being crucified through his hands and his feet. The nail prints, the physical suffering of Christ upon Calvary really were hardly felt. We think about them as significant, but they were hardly felt when compared to the mental anguish. You know, Psalm 88 says that Christ could not see through the portholes of the tomb. In verse 3, the psalmist says, For my soul is full of troubles. Again, prophetically speaking of Christ, my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with them, verse 4, that go down to the pen. I am as a man that has no strength, mm -hmm. free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more. They are cut off from thy hand. Thy wrath, thy, thou hast, verse 6, thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. Thou hast afflicted with me with all thy waves. Selah. Thou hast put away, verse 8, mine acquaintances far from me. Remember his disciples, everyone left him, fled. Mm -hmm. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. Christ could not see through the portals of the tomb. The Bible, Bible indicates that Christ will bear the marks of the crucifixion for all eternity. You know, the redeemed will be fully made new, but there'll be one reminder throughout all eternity of the pain, the emotional pain and not just the physical pain that sin has brought to the heart of God. In John chapter 20, 25 to 27, Jesus tells Philip, put your hands in, my, in the nail prints and see. Right, so even after his resurrection, Jesus Christ bears those nail prints. In fact, there's a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 13, verse six, where one shall say unto him, Jesus, what are these wounds mm. in thine hands? And he will answer and say, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Mm. It's a beautiful picture really of the heart of God mm. in the book, Welfare Ministry, pages 24 and 25. It talks about how this world is a vast laser house. And then in the book, Education, on page 263, we're told that God's Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings with, which cannot be uttered. As the whole creation groans and travails in pain together, the heart of the Infinite Father is pained in sympathy. Our world is a vast laser house, a scene of misery that we dare not allow even our thoughts to dwell upon. Did we realize it as it is, the burden would be too terrible, mm -hmm. yet God feels it all. In order to destroy sin and its results, He gave His best beloved and He has put it in our power through cooperation with Him to bring the scene of misery to an end. Mm. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Mm. So we think about laments, we want to include God in all of it because God hearts, God's heart throbs with the pain and the suffering that is going on on planet Earth. God longs for us to participate in His grace and in this great gospel commission so that He can bring this all to an end. Mm -hmm. Love scars is what God bears in His hands and in His feet. Love scars is what Jesus Christ carries sure. as a reminder of this pain and suffering. There's a poem that reads like this, in time eternal they will ask unknowing of the countless saved, walking with him by that river about those marks so deep and grave. Lovingly the Savior tells them agape love for all mankind and as they wonder in amazement from their gaze a tear he hides. The call of death he chose to answer, yes if only just for one, yet now he looks with greatest pleasure a countless host adore his son. Mm -hmm. We may forget our closest loved ones in eternal timeless joy, love scars he bears, his mind reflective, bring memories of this girl, that boy. Hmm.
A look to us brings satisfaction, precious burden carried home. His labor reaped, his grief rewarded, the man who trod the press alone. Yet now he waits with earnest longing every moment of each day for one more son, for one more daughter, one less tear to hide away. Restored by grace and to his image, to all the world constrained proclaim what wondrous love is this presented for him the woe, for us the gain. You may, be, you may doubt the gift's been given, purchased by the life so dear. Then look beyond the starry heaven for the source of every tear. All love, all feelings, all compassion find their source in his own heart. The pain we all are ever feeling have been there carried from the start. Mm -hmm. God's love for us, God's lament for us is also part of the way that God restores us to his own. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. Man, this was just a powerful study this week. Yes, it uh, was. Saturated with the gospel message. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's go ahead and take the final few moments we have to get some final thoughts. Final thought. Are you burdened beyond measure? It's okay to tell God that. It's okay. As Paul said, we were burdened beyond measure. Mm. Had the sentence of death in our heart. But remember what Paul said his purpose was. God allowed it so that you would learn to trust in times of trouble and not trust in yourself, but trust in him who loved you so much, he died for you. Amen. Mm -hmm. The Psalm of the Cross, Psalm 22, begins with devastation and despair, but it ends with a song of praise that ends like this. He has done this. It's one word in Hebrew, finished, mm -hmm. which makes us think about Jesus on the cross. It is finished. My grace is sufficient. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. No matter what you're going through, know that you can come boldly before the throne of grace and you will find grace and mercy and help in your time of need. Amen. 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 The last little part of that poem, when you, it, when you wonder if our evil can cause his love for us to change, consider this eternal gospel, ceaseless study of the saved. We'll be studying the gospel and the cross of Christ throughout all eternity amen. to see God's heart for us. Amen. amen, amen. Created me a clean heart, O God, mm -hmm. and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation mm -hmm. and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm chapter 51, verses 10 to 12. I pray that prayer often. I pray it every day because each and every day we need to wake up anew in Jesus Christ, created and made anew. Don't miss next week right here on the 3ABN Sabbath School panel, lesson number three entitled, The Lord Reigns. Mm -hmm.